Hello, everyone, and patrons, and um, listeners, and welcome to the Queen Sophia Spanish Institute. My name is Patrice Degnan, and I'm the executive director um, of the Institute. And part of our cultural series uh, includes medical education. And our, our background is a cultural institute in the United States focuses on Spain and the Spanish speaking world's contribution to the United States. And um, medical education is really relevant because for so many years, we have consistently had prominent Spanish doctors who have made names and careers for themselves in, in the United States. And today, um, we have a brilliant doctor with whom we have not had a chance to meet before. So this is for, for our, us a, a wonderful opportunity. So um, Dr. Adolfo Garcia Sastre is our guest today. Dr. Garcia Sastre is PhD, Director of the Global Health and Emerging Pathogens Institute at Mount Sinai. And um, it is a very relevant area and um, we are so happy to have you, um, Dr. Adolfo. And I will call you Adolfo because you let you told me I could. <laughs> but um, welcome, welcome to our institute. I don't know if you you knew about us. Well, th thank you, thank you for having me here. Uh, I heard about you, but I didn't follow up what uh, what were your uh, the things that you were doing. And, but I'm uh, very happy to be here now. Great, great. Yeah, we are just for your information. We're 66 years young. I like to say, and um, we're in New York. It's a nonprofit, private organization. And as I said, um, our legendary doctors uh, includes the chairman of pathology for Mount Sinai, uh, Dr. Carlos Cordon Cardo, who happens to also be our chairman. So um, your team and Dr. Valentin Foster is also a board member. Yeah. Very good colleagues, very good colleagues. Well, I'm sure you feel um, happy to have them as, as fellow Spaniards. Was that one of the um, <clears throat> reasons why you picked Mount Sinai or did was that just another circumstance? No, that was another circumstance. Uh, Carlos actually came later than me uh, to Mount Sinai. Uh, mm -hmm. Val Fuster has been here, I think, since a long time. But, uh, but my field um, of research is different from the one of, of Val, um, Valentin. Um, I'm, I'm a microbiologist. Um, so uh, I knew that he was here when, when I came because uh, obviously, um, everybody knows uh, Dr. Fuster, yes. uh, but uh, uh, I came here as a postdoc, so as a, as a small fish, uh, let's say, and I didn't have the opportunity to meet him uh, directly till, uh, till I have all, already my own lab and I was a professor. I mean, to me, he was always a, an unreachable figure, right, in the beginning yes. when I came because uh, he was already very well recognized, uh, very famous. And I was just starting, a, a, yeah. a small guy is starting to do research here in, in, uh, in the United States. Well, you are very humble because today, more than ever, I think everyone's minds and hearts are really looking towards you, you the medical teams and scientists in particular, to help us really unwrap the um, situation, which is... Um, as they say, uh, there's a beginning and uh, a beginning and afterwards, and we don't know in these uncertain times where we are going with respect to the COVID. But before we get to that, I would love you to tell us a little bit about the path that took you um, to become Director of Global Health and Emerging Pathogens at Mount Sinai in New York City from Burgos, España. Yes. <laughs> Okay, so I think um, to me, uh, my, my career path started um, in uh, high school, right? Um, I have a, a great uh, teacher uh, in biology in high school. That what, was the, what was the teacher's name? Let's give it a little round of applause. <laughs> yeah, um, that, you know, because of the uh, Spanish, um, um, uh, I need I need to think a little bit more about you know the switch between English and Spanish to come, out, to come out. But but he's a very good friend of mine. He has uh, contacted me several times. Um, but but I right now 
that my the name because of the English is uh, is evading me. I tell of you, course. I tell you a little bit later, Certainly. because I, I really appreciate him a lot, and and we correspond by email. He's now he's now in Leon, um, uh, teaching, still teaching. Well, uh, I think he retired recently, uh, but uh, but he's following me, uh, so so that's great. Um, Wonderful. It's the full circle of life, isn't it? Yeah, so so um, he motivated me a lot to uh, to uh, um, for biology. Uh, basically, they um, try to understand how life works. Uh, mm -hmm. It's so fascinating, and that uh, um, uh, because of that, I made the decision to uh, do to go to study biology in, uh, in university. And um, um, I there was no biology in uh, in Burgos at this time. There was no biology in uh, Valladolid, uh, which will be, would have been the, at this time, uh, the, to join the university, you should join um, the university of your own community, um, if you mm -hmm. can. So the, the, the only place that there was in the community in, of uh, Castilla Leon um, with, uh, with biology was Salamanca. Uh, and that was the reason why I finished in Salamanca, uh, studying biology. Uh, and there, um, very early on, um, I was contacted uh, when I was second year um, by the Department of Biochemistry, where I wanted to uh, start to do some research there or to be trained in research. And that was, uh, they contacted me because I, I was having very good grades. At this time, everything was all about grades, nothing, nothing about uh, um, research uh, that I'd done before or anything like that. And, and I said yes, and then I started uh, to do some uh, research in, in biochemistry. And when I finished uh, university, um, I decided to uh, continue on doing my, my PhD there in Salamanca, right? So I applied for a fellowship um, in, uh, from the government in Spain. I, I received a fellowship for doing the PhD. This allowed me to, to be able to do the PhD. And, um, and there, I, uh, my PhD was uh, in, uh, in biochemistry, but using a protein from, from a virus. Um, so, and that was uh, also how I got exposed to viruses. Um, so, so after my PhD, um, I was um, thinking in, in going abroad. There was possibility of getting fellowships to go abroad, to get exposed outside of, of Spain to, um, to research environment. Um, the, the most uh, interesting groups that I wanted to join, they were in the United States, that they were doing really great uh, uh, research. So I contact um, the group here of, uh, in, in Monsigne, of Peter Palese, uh, which is still the chairman of microbiology here in Monsigne. And he accepted me to go there. Um, so I, I came here with a fellowship. Um, I came here also with my wife. Um, we met in Salamanca. She, uh, the time that I finished the PhD, um, she finished the, the biology um, studies, the university. And then we got married, came here. Uh, she actually worked as a volunteer in research for, for a while, till she had some experience and then joined the PhD program here in uh, in also in Monsigne, and now she has also her own lab and, and is directing her own group. So uh, here also in Monsigne, so we we have different groups. We collaborate from time to time, but but it's great. You know, it has been great for us uh, the opportunities that we found in this country. And uh, and then everything started to go, you know, fast uh, without me noticing how the years go by. Right? Just trying to do research, um, trying to think about um, big picture um, questions in virology, mainly with influenza viruses, trying to apply for grants to get money, um, getting promoted at the same time because I was um, able to get grants and I was able to publish well, um, and becoming an independent lab and, and getting my own group and getting good, very good people in my lab that had helped me to, to do all the studies that we have done and, and years just passed by. And, um, and now we are here, 30 years later almost. Um, Many years? 30 years later. Yeah. No, 30. Yeah, it's, well, it's 29 and a half. <laughs> you look very young. I would have said a decade, but um, <laughs> New York City must be treating you well. Um, <laughs> with respect to um, the global health situation, yep. how much international interdependence and cooperation is there between Spain and the United States and the rest of the world in the development of a vaccine response to COVID-19? 
Well, they, they, they are multiple groups that are trying for a, for a vaccine, right? And, and I think the good news is that most of the vaccines that, um, that are being tried are likely to work, I, th I think. Uh, I may be, you know, you can never be 100% sure, but mm -hmm. I think that they are, they are likely to work. Uh, there are multiple approaches, um, and, the, and the results are coming very fast uh, as, as, as people are producing them. So that, that there is a nice interchange of information uh, we know um, exactly how many approaches there are around, how many there are in preclinical work, how many there are in clinical work. And that's, I think, is a, is a time where actually it's been needed a lot of interchange of information, uh, both for vaccines and for therapeutics. And this is happening. That's the interesting thing. Now, vaccines is a, is, uh, has the complication that in addition to find a, a good vaccine, it takes uh, uh, very big uh, studies to prove that they are effective. So for that, one needs to establish groups that they know about clinical research and to be able to get the funding that is required for, for doing these studies. And then there is the manufacturing component, right? Which is the manufacturing component is something that needs to be dealt with pharma. Uh, it's something that cannot be done in, in academia. Um, and, and there are some academic groups that they, they have good candidates. There are some pharma groups that they have good candidates. And at the end, I hope that um, the, uh, the most promising ones will continue to be moved into human clinical trials, because even if the ones that are now uh, more uh, close to a, get a phase three efficacy trial, they are actually giving good results, so they can be used right away. I'm sure that there will be a lot of room for improvement, especially for protection of high-risk groups, uh, and, and perhaps um, in the in the long run, getting in the beginning we start with the vaccine that we know it works and it has some efficacy, but perhaps these vaccines are being uh, replaced later on by some of the vaccines that they have a enhanced efficacy or a longer duration of immunity, and that that that's the interesting thing. Now, there is a, a lot of interest on that. There are a lot of challenges, though. Mm -hmm. And uh, most of the challenges are, 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 are because of the uncertainties about what is required to, uh, to get a protective immune response by a vaccine, and also because of the challenges in manufacturing. Um, not only so we, don't, we need not only to know whether the vaccine works, but also it needs uh, to be produced. And sometimes that's also that is very challenging especially when we need a vaccine that is producing very uh, large amounts in order to cover um, at the end what we want to cover is the whole world, right? So, so that, that's one of the biggest challenges. Um, but otherwise, the, the science is, is moving quickly and hopefully um, that will allow for uh, getting a vaccine, um, uh, unfortunately not tomorrow, but, uh, sure. but at the beginning of next year, we are lucky. Well, that's good news because from my understanding, until um, today, vaccines for pandemics usually take six years to, from start to finish. Is that? Yeah, that, that's probably the most, um, the, the most likely um, scenario. Uh, one of the reasons why it takes uh, long, I mean, vaccines need, first they need to be uh, needed as, as a business, uh, unfortunately, as a business uh, concept, right? Because uh, it takes also a lot of money to develop a vaccine. So usually the pharma want to get something in return once that they have produced a vaccine that it know is working. And, and this is uh, this is quite uh, challenging. And now the the pace in which vaccine has been produced has been a, a low pace. Uh, but a lot has to do with um, uh, removing risk. Um, uh, so so doing the studies that that they saw that is likely to work, uh, more studies that is likely to work before you conduct the large studies that are. Um, that require a lot of money uh, in order to see whether they are they are working, and so that's that's what has made the pace going uh, slowly. That um, there was a risk adverse um, uh, um, type of uh, mind setting that uh, unless uh, you do a lot of studies, um, small studies, making sure that the vaccine. It's gonna work and it's gonna work, uh, and then uh, then at the end doing the largest study with a lot of money that is required to demonstrate efficacy, 
um, you know, the, 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 the companies always wanted to have um, some good assurance that at the end of phase three clinical trial will work. And that's what that makes a vaccine very, very long. Um, mm -hmm. Now with this, we need, it's, it's so important to get a vaccine that um, uh, people are taking risk, uh, financial risks, um, which uh, makes sense because mm -hmm. uh, the benefits that we can get from the vaccine are, are bigger than uh, if the first vaccine doesn't work, uh, losing some money because this vaccine was not working and therefore the money that was put it together in order to prove whether it's working or not, um, at the end uh, didn't pay off. But, uh, but there are more coming and, and that's why I think uh, this thing has been done now um, the best way that, that, that we can do it. And, and as I say, unfortunately, there, uh, there is no uh, way to go faster. We, people are trying to go as fast as possible. And, and unfortunately, there are also uh, many challenges still ahead, uh, which is, uh, have to do with uh, how to decide how to do the clinical trial, the final clinical trial, especially when it's unclear uh, the number of infections that is going to be when this trial is being made in the, in the place that is going to be conducted, um, which is required in order to know whether the vaccine is protective or not. If, you, if right now we will have a vaccine uh, to be tested, and we try to test it, for example, in Spain, uh, there is very little amount of infections at this moment in Spain, so, so you will need an extremely large group of people um, uh, that need to be vaccinated in order to know whether they have an impact on infections, right? Um, so that this is one of the challenges where where the the final efficacy trials will be done, um, so that they, they need to be done in places where there is enough number of infections to know that there is um, that there is uh, a, 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 an efficacious vaccine. But uh, you know, people are thinking about how to do that, and, and the other challenge is the manufacturing uh, and how to share the vaccine, the first vaccines that they come, how to share between different countries and uh, what each country needs to do in order to be able to produce vaccine that works. That's the, that's, that's the challenge. Right. <clears throat> From a layman's perspective, um, it's sometimes difficult for people to understand the impact of the COVID-19 versus the impact of influenza, the common flu, because until last year, we were all very aware that a vaccine against the flu every year was quite important, and then that killed millions of people. And um, could you give us um, your um, approximation with respect to to both of these scenarios right now, COVID nineteen versus influenza? I mean, are they comparable? Just one, just one second. Si estoy en medio de la entrevista, me está grabando. Dime. No, déjame te lo firmo otra vez. Yes, sorry. Yes, yes, one second. It's okay. Al menos no es vivo, ¿sabes? Lo están grabando. Maddie can edit this out. Yeah, sorry about it. No problem at all. I guess um, and we, so, we, I was asking regarding the influenza versus the COVID-19 and the percentage of, um, you know, mortality on both yeah. of those fronts. Yes. Are they comparable? Yeah. So, so I, I think in terms of influenza, we need to distinguish that there are two types of uh, influenza um, in terms of disease. One is seasonal influenza, which is the typical flu that there is every year for which we get vaccinated and we get vaccinated every year because the strains are changing every year slightly from one to another. That's seasonal flu. But we know that also flu from time to time come as pandemic. And, um, and there have been several pandemias of influenza the, the most uh, devastating one was the 1918 pandemic. So it, we, we come, the, the pandemic that was in 1918, that was um, uh, uh, typically referred as the Spanish flu. Um, and but it did the, not start in Spain, correct? Didn't start in Spain, no. Uh, it was to call the Spanish flu because uh, news about the, the virus was uh, given in Spain and the rest of Europe was not doing any news because that was during the the First World War, and uh, they didn't want to publicize that there is this uh, um, disease that is devastating and killing more soldiers in the front than actually the, the war. Um, but Spain was not in war, so that so that's uh, um, it was uh, newspapers were publishing about this um, this disease. So because you read that it's in Spain in the newspapers, and you don't read it that it's any anywhere else, people thought it came from Spain, right? 
Well, this is very uh, important. I think this is news breaking as well, that we are kind of confirming that it is, was not started in Spain. Was exactly. it started in, in the United States? Was it Kansas? Well, it's unclear the origin. There are several theories. One that seems to be um, a good one is that it, it started the first in, in the middle of the United States, uh, this, this, uh, the first outbreak. And then um, uh, that was uh, imported uh, or exported from the United States to Europe. Mm -hmm. And in Europe is where I actually started uh, having a lot of cases and then um, imported back into the United States and going to the rest of the world. The, the other theories that actually started in Europe, um, I think both, uh, both are good possibilities. Uh, and it's unclear, right, because the only thing that we have is historical records. We cannot go and find out traces of the virus. Even, even with the new pandemic that we have right now, the COVID-19, we know that um, the biggest spreading is starting in Wuhan, but exactly where in Wuhan happened, uh, the first case, mm -hmm. is very difficult to trace because um, for that we would need to get access to the first case, which uh, we don't know which one it is, right? Um, but, uh, but, I, but as I was saying, um, the 1918 flu um, was probably uh, and, uh, most likely more um, um, even dangerous and, uh, and causing more lethality than the SARS-CoV-2. Now, uh, the, the difference is that uh, with now SARS-CoV-2, uh, we have a way of communication that was completely different from the way of communication that was in, 19, in 1918. Um, so people is aware of this very quickly. And, and there is a, a um, uh, countries are trying to prevent uh, quickly spreading by uh, doing um, isolation uh, techniques or confinement techniques, right? Because we don't have right now uh, vaccines or antivirals. And this type of things was more difficult to put together in, in 1918, especially in the context of a, of a war like that, that was in Europe, right? With many countries. Okay. So that, that, that make a completely different scenario there was very little um, isolation and confinement that happened during 1918. There was some uh, some areas, some islands where they, they did that and they were successful, but in the in, in most of the of the world there was no uh, measure, uh, no practical measures of uh, social distancing or anything like that, and that resulted in a devastating pandemic, right? right. Uh, but this created already a precedent, um, historical precedent about what can happen during a pandemic, uh, um, or especially a respiratory uh, pandemic. And that's, um, that's uh, we are now looking, it's not flu, what is causing that is, is this COVID-19. But in terms of how it behaves, it's very similar to this pandemic flu. Now, it's different from seasonal flu. Seasonal flu um, does not cause so much problem as pandemic flu. One of the reasons is because um, there is a, people that have immunity because is vaccinated or because has been exposed to multiple flu strains that is immune against seasonal flu, then the amount of infections that seasonal flu cause, they are not as big as the amount of infections that COVID-19 can cause in which everybody is susceptible. Seasonal flu, there is um, people that are susceptible and people that are not. And now among the susceptible ones, the, the mortality rate is lower than the one that you get uh, with COVID-19. And now, having said that, it's true that flu causes, uh, seasonal flu causes um, every year around half a million deaths. And uh, we are getting now these numbers with COVID-19. And then we can say, okay, so why is this so different? Because uh, we have not gone uh, very far away from what seasonal flu cause. Uh, the main difference is the speed, is the speed in which the cases accumulate, and then act as also the, um, how much is gonna be the absolute number of cases if we let the virus go by itself. If we let the virus to go by itself, probably will cause um, between five to six times more deaths than influenza in one year. And six times more deaths than influenza in one year is, is a lot of is a lot of deaths. Uh, you can say, well, it's the same deaths that six years of influenza, which is also a lot of deaths. But these are espaciated in different times, and this allows that uh, 
one can at least handle uh, the people and uh, not getting the hospitals full and collapsing of, of the uh, sanitary structure. And that's, that's the problem with this, uh, with this uh, pandemic. And that will be very similar if a very aggressive pandemic of influenza happens with the difference that for influenza, which is likely that the pandemic will happen also sooner or later, with influenza at least we can produce a vaccine more quickly. And the reason why we can produce a vaccine more quickly is because we know the vaccines that work and we know how they work. So we don't need to uh, do a, a phase three clinical trial to find out whether um, if you vaccinate against the new flu, then you get protected against the new flu. You just need to see what is the antibody response that you get with the new vaccine. And is this antibody response according from what we know about flu able to protect? This one we know with flu. We don't know with COVID-19, and that's the reason why a vaccine will take longer for COVID-19 than this will have been a pandemic flu. One question. Would you recommend that people get vaccinated this fall against the common flu? Oh, yes, that, that's, that's essential. I don't know at the end what that's going to be the policy. So I know in Spain, the policy is not uh, everybody should get vaccinated, only the, the risk groups. But, but the, the main problem that we can encounter is because um, is uh, a, a, a both uh, increase of cases of both flu and, and COVID-19. So in addition to COVID-19, we need to take care of, of the flu cases. And well, the symptoms, important. the clinical symptoms are very similar in the beginning. Mm -hmm. And that makes also then um, uh, the di diagnosis becomes more complicated. Right now, if someone has respiratory symptoms and sort of breath, then it's likely to be COVID-19. And then even before the diagnosis should go to the hospital and try to be treated. Um, if it, in, the, in the fall or in the winter, when this has happened, you don't know if it's flu or if it's COVID-19. But if you are vaccinated, then there's gonna be less flu cases and that will help in uh, the managing of COVID-19. And when should people be vaccinated for the common influenza? For the common influenza, the vaccination campaigns are usually around November. Mm -hmm. uh, November is a good month because in general, the peak of influenza is around uh, uh, February, um, starting January and February. And for a vaccine, it takes one month to, to be effective, to induce immunity. So you get vaccinated in November, mm -hmm. you develop protective immunity if the vaccine was working well. It doesn't work well in all the cases, but it works well in a, in a percentage of cases. And this is the ones that we want to have. Um, the, you, the people that get protected will get protected in uh, starting in December. And usually uh, this protective immunity with the flu vaccine lasts around uh, five months. So mm -hmm. then one, one is protected for the months of December, January, February, March, which goes over the flu season, and that, that will help. If one starts immunizations now, then uh, five months later, the immunity has waned, and, uh, and, and we have not yet, most likely five months later, we have not started the flu season, so one will need to get revaccinated. Perfect. <clears throat> November is the date then. You know, uh, Adolfo, there's so much misinformation on this 24-hour news cycle that we all are living because of increased technology, and, and I would love to understand what is scientifically true and false about the pandemic. It seems that there's vital information for everyone to clearly understand about the pandemic. And I think the, the point you just made is brilliant that we must continue to watch out for the influenza and get vaccinated in November. Um, but are there certain, is there certain information that you read in the press that you say, oh boy, um, this is so erroneous. Could you um, help, in layman's terms, us to understand better what is important and, under, and what we need to understand about the, the pandemic and COVID yeah. right now? Please. I, I think right now the, the most important message that everybody should have is that the, everybody has a responsibility, everybody, of uh, um, doing the best for slowing down the number of uh, infections. And uh, one should recognize um, that people become infectious even before they develop symptoms. 
That means that nobody can know for sure whether it's infectious or not. And because of that, then trying to prevent as much possible close contacts between people, I don't say to completely eliminate them, but try to prevent it as much as possible. And if you need to have a close contact, use um, as many precautions as you can by having masks to prevent uh, formation of, of droplets that can infect uh, the other person, um, by, um, by the conducting a hygiene, hand hygiene um, after being in public spaces. Uh, because it's not only the question about whether one gets infected or not. The majority of the people that, uh, that will get infected with COVID-19 will have a mild disease. Um, they, it, this is a little bit more difficult in the, in the risk groups where there is more proportion that they will have a severe disease. Uh, but even, even normal person can get severe disease. But more importantly, um, a normal person can infect, uh, can propagate the virus if it gets infected and nobody takes precautions, then the virus propagates very quickly. And at the end, uh, there are so many cases that there, there start to be mortality uh, ramping up. And especially the virus getting into, into the high, uh, the, 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 the risk groups, right? Uh, so, so the most important thing is that we should do, we have all of us the responsibility to try to make an impact in reducing the number of infections just by being responsible. Um, uh, I think that's the main message. Uh, the second message is that the, the, the guilty one is the virus. Here there is no, um, the reason why we are like that is because um, uh, there was not enough measures that were put into to doing that, uh, this obviously has to do with, with this thing, but, but the guilty one are not whoever is doing the policy, the guilty one is, is the virus, and that's what mm -hmm. we should concentrate on, yeah. trying, trying to concentrate in how we can mitigate the virus with a vaccine or with a therapy. Um, and, uh, and then there is also misinformation about uh, how this virus was, was made, uh, where, where it came from, um, there has been a lot of rumors that, uh, that perhaps uh, was man-made, um, that, uh, um, uh, you know, a lot of, the, it, it also about treatments and sometimes some treatments has been hyped um, without enough information. I think, I think it's important to know where the information comes from and to contrast this information and especially listening not, not to one scientist, but listen to multiple scientists, uh, which are the ones that they, they will tell how much information there is uh, in order to know what really has happened. I mean, there, there has been a lot of rumors that the virus is becoming more virulent, that the virus is becoming less virulent, that the virus is becoming more contagious, that, that uh, you know, and uh, this doesn't mean that these things are happening, but actually there is no evidence that this is happening. So it's, it's a question of what is the evidence and listening to the voice of multiple scientists, not, not only one, because one scientist could be also uh, be wrong. Uh, not, not every scientist is right. So listening to multiple scientists as, as your source of information and, uh, and, and see what, and, and then contrast information. I, I think that's, that's important. Wonderful. Um, the, uh, Dr. Fauci of the White House Task Force yep. has um, predicted that it could become a cyclical event, the COVID-19, and predicts the inevitability of a second cycle beginning in the fall of 2020. Do you agree with this medical scientific opinion? Yeah, yes, I agree with that, but that's also if we don't do anything, right? So if we don't do anything, if we, if we uh, conduct business as usual now and start to conduct business as usual, then inevitably there's going to be a, a, a big peak again in, in winter. Um, maybe starting in the fall, maybe starting a little bit later, but that's, that's going to happen. But um, we have the opportunity, we have the, the means how to prevent this, this peak. We are not like in the beginning of the pandemic in which uh, there was a shortage of diagnostic tests. Um, we didn't know how many people were infected. Diagnostic tests started very late to ramp it up. Um, at the time that uh, it was recognized that there was infections, there was a lot of infections in the countries where they have been problematic or in the region that have been problematic. 
we have the opportunity to recognize now early on mm -hmm. whether there are increasing infections in, in, in local communities. And uh, there is no guarantee that, that by doing that, we are gonna prevent uh, spreading. But, it's, but there is a good possibility that if we are smart and we are ramping up diagnosis and not diagnosing everybody, but, uh, but doing a specific diagnosis that allow us to recognize local outbreaks and having the means how to know what contacts the people that are identifying these local outbreaks have so they can be also tested and they can be isolated, the contacts. If one has this capability, then it's very likely that one will be able to contain the virus. This adding that to responsibility, social distancing, then it might be possible to contain the virus, but only if we work together. Uh, so if we don't do anything, then, then this is gonna again uh, happen, it's gonna again happen the same thing that happened um, in the last month. Well, you have some very um, important advice and knowledge that is um, encouraging. And, and lastly, I just wanted to ask you, um, I know you're busy, what are some of the other public health threats that you and your fellow uh, scientists are um, working on and that the world needs to better understand? Because it seems like we're very on topic as a yeah. world concern. Yeah, I, I, th I think there, there, there are two major um, threats. Uh, uh, one is uh, the zoonotic infections and the so emergence zoonotic. Zoonotic means um, viruses that jump from animals to humans, like like this SARS coronavirus. Um, why? It came from the bats, right? It came from bats, yeah. Mm -hmm. So. Um, there is other viruses that we know they come from animals and they, they, and they cause problems in humans. Ebola is one example. Um, mm -hmm. There is some evidence that is likely to come also from bats, but we don't know completely. But it comes from an animal, it is clear. Um, and, and some of the reasons why these things happen is because uh, there is an increase in, uh, in um, contacts between humans and animals, just because there is more density of, of humans and uh, humans are getting into areas um, that before there was very little contact between humans and, and wild animals and now there is more, right? So this, um, this together with the density that we have right now and also together with the density that we do in agricultural practices like a large amount of, of domestic animals that are used for food consumption creates a potential fertile ground for events to ha happen like that either by previous amplification in a domestic animal and then going to humans or, or, or this, this, type, this type of events. So, so that, and the, the, the important thing is, is to recognize that they are completely unpredictable. Uh, we can think that there is more risk or less risk, for example, coronavirus, a coronavirus outbreak, one can say that could have been predicted because what happened with SARS and with MERS, that we were just a little bit sort of becoming, becoming a pandemic with these episodes. Um, so therefore, perhaps it's not so surprising that we have a, a pandemic with uh, this virus, but exactly which virus was going to cause the pandemic, this particular SARS-CoV-2 versus uh, thousands of other related SARS-like viruses that they are in the wild, uh, we couldn't predict it. It is impossible for us to predict. And when this is going to happen, mm -hmm. that also we cannot predict. We know that if we reduce the, the contacts between humans and, and animals, Mm -hmm. um, there will be less likelihood that this is happening, but this is also very difficult to implement in the in these uh, times with the density of human population that there is. But so so that's one one of the problem uh, the the problem about emerging viruses, either zoonotic like I mentioned, or the other possibility is viruses that they were endemic in very small populations they they become global, and that's that's for example was the example of Zika. Zika was was. It was not a new virus. That was a virus that was with us for a long time, but it was causing only very small number of infections and suddenly becomes globalized. And why it becomes globalized? Because of the same thing that these zoonotic infections, because finally it's able to escape from the environment that it was causing endemic and come now to an area where it can propagate more quickly 
due to high density of humans and due, in this case, also high density of mosquitoes. Was was that the, were you talking Sida? Zika, Zika virus. Zika. Zika, yeah. The, the, the outbreak that we have with Zika virus. Um, so so, so these, are, these are the things that we, have, that we need to watch for. Outbreaks with viruses that they are endemic but causing um, very small uh, percentage of infections. And they are not, uh, there is no uh, good immunity in the rest of the population and can jump uh, at one moment from being very local in one area to expanding globally. And the other are viruses that come from animals that may make, may make these jumps. Uh, right. And this again um, is difficult to predict. So we need to be prepared for that. Yeah. So, that, so that's, that's one of the problems. The second problem that there is in, uh, in infectious diseases is um, resistance. And that's uh, right now uh, mainly with, uh, with, with bacteria, not so much with viruses, but also it can happen with viruses. So resistance is we uh, discover um, many years ago antibiotics, which they have been wonderful in order to prevent death from bacteria. And they have been working really great. And because of that, they have, we have saved a lot of lives. But now with the time passing uh, during uh, this since the discovery of antibiotics, the widely used of antibiotics have resulted in selection of bacteria that are multidrug resistant. And there is very little that we can do against these multidrug resistant bacteria because they are resistant to most of the antibiotics that we have. And we need to be very careful about these ones not becoming more prevalent and having new antibiotics that are able to um, uh, treat infections with these multidrugs resistant organisms. So I think that's the, the two major problems that we are uh, uh, facing with respect to infectious diseases. One is emerging viruses, either endemics that become pandemics or a animal virus that becomes suddenly human virus. And the other is the multidrug resistant pathogens. Well, Thank you so much. Um, Adolfo, let me ask you a lighthearted question. What is your life like in New York um, now with your, your Spanish wife? Do you le lead a very Spanish lifestyle in New York City or have you adapted um, after 30 years of being here to the customs of the, um, of the United States? Well, we have, we have dinner at uh, 10, which uh, that's a very Spanish, that's a very Spanish <laughs> Thing, no? uh, um, uh, New York is a great city uh, because mm -hmm. it's a city of immigrants and, um, and um, everybody, uh, whether you are a New Yorker or from generations uh, to generations to whether you are just a newcomer, um, it's a city that, um, that somehow embrace immigration or you feel that you are part of it, right? Um, I mean, I've been out in, in many different places uh, but I think uh, in New York, you don't feel foreigner. Um, no. any, in any other place, yes. uh, you, you always feel a little bit foreigner. I mean, they can, they, they, they can be very nice people, but, but you know that they have a sense of community to which you don't belong completely. Right. I think New York is one of the exceptions. You, I mean, from the very first time that I came here, I felt like I was... A New Yorker already. Why? Because everybody was like me, you know, it was, there was so right. many people that just were recently arrived here and exactly. they were part of the city. Uh, so so that, that's one of the, the great things about, about New York, you know, and hopefully we will go, um, we will also um, come up from this uh, pandemic. Uh, I mean, New York is known to be very resilient. We have gone through, uh, through many things, um, yes. uh, including, including September 11. Uh, yes. And, and hopefully, you know, this, this thing uh, um, at, at the end um, will be just yes, a memory yeah, of the past that, that hopefully is not forgotten, but, but it's still uh, a memory of the past. Yeah. Well, I think that's the beauty of um, being mature in one's life, that we have that perspective of having lived other um, t tough um, situations. But I agree. I think New York is cosmopolitan, embracing, and, and also very Hispanic. I mean, and yes, yeah, they're also very Hispanic, yeah. So, and that's uh, really positive um, to to feel embraced, and that we all have to do that in all of our lives and all over the United States. 
yeah, in our situation, uh, my family, um, I, we co I consider my, ourselves lucky. We have two kids, but they are 21 and 18. And uh, they are now with us because obviously university was closed. Um, they were both in university. But, but it's very different that if, if this would have happened when the kids are five and three, for example, yeah. right? Because um, that uh, with the schools closed and you cannot leave the, the, the kids at home and you cannot have also a babysitter that comes because of the potential uh, problems with the contagious. I think for, for people that have small kids, this is, these are very hard times uh, Absolutely. Due, Absolutely. To, due to all, all, all the, yeah, the, the, the things that one need to take care of now. But, uh, you know, with kids that are 21 and 18 and are responsible, then things are, things are more easy. So they will behave. That's very good. They'll be happy to hear that. They will behave and they can, they can stay uh, uh, home alone, right? Exactly, exactly. And well, they can help also. So that, that's the, I that's hope nice. so. <laughs> Dolfo, thank you so much, Dr. Adolfo Garcia Sastre. It was such a pleasure and your um, humility and your efforts at making our lives safer is so commendable. We thank you from the bottom of our heart and hope to have you as a regular friend of the um, Queen Sophia Spanish Institute because you represent the best of Spain, the best of the United States. So it's, um, es un lujo okay. conocerte. Muchas gracias, igualmente. Gracias. Me encanta haberte conocido. Muy bien. Hasta pronto. Adiós. Hasta pronto. Adiós. Adiós.